Well, I think everyone here probably knows who we are by now, but we are the Knoxville History Project. Our mission is to research, preserve, and promote the history and culture of Knoxville, Tennessee. And as I was talking about, yeah, today today at, at noon, we, uh, we, we every year we do a, an annual luncheon, or we have done since 2017. Um, obviously, three or four years we were at the foundry, but not last year and not this year either, but we hope we will be there next year. Uh, so we did um, something a little bit different again this year, and that was we broadcasted on YouTube and um, Facebook using a new platform to us called uh, StreamYard. Anyway, the, uh, obviously, uh, we are an educational nonprofit. We rely and exist um, on uh, donations, uh, amongst other things, of course. Uh, we do private research, but also sell books and take grants and everything like that. But one of the things that we do as part of our annual event is to honor uh, an individual or a couple in the community that have made significant contributions to what we know about the city's history. And this year uh, we chose, uh, the board helped chose, uh, choose uh, Dr. Charles and Terry Faulkner. And so we're gonna be concentrating on their work tonight and using them as a jump off point to learn a bit more about uh, Knoxville history and various subjects. But uh, if you'd like to consider making a donation, uh, we sincerely appreciate it. Uh, you can do that very easily through our donate page um, on our website, OxfordHistoryProject.org. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Jack, and uh, I'll be back in a, in a little bit for showing the film that we showed at lunchtime and um, some images with some more stories. Jack? And you are muted, Jack? Yeah. Sorry, there was a, a fire truck going by and I muted myself. Uh, but we're pleased to be able to present uh, tonight for the first time on a Zoom, a, a world premiere, at least as of today, world premiere film. Uh, and that is uh, a film about the honorees, uh, Charlie and Terry Faulkner. Uh, and the film is made uh, by our good friend and, and, and longtime founding board member, Linda Billman, who is a longtime producer and writer for the Heartland series on WBR uh, for many years, and, and her uh, former Heartland colleague, Doug Mills, a uh, talented uh, cameraman. But the film is all about uh, Charlie and Terry Faulkner, uh, who are our, our friends, uh, uh, Charlie and Terry Faulkner. Uh, Charlie uh, is a former professor, Professor Emeritus at the University of Tennessee in, in uh, archaeology. Uh, he's probably the best known archaeologist who's done extensive work uh, in historical archaeology, especially in the city of Knoxville. And this is something we don't always think about when we think about uh, uh, historians. Uh, archaeologists, we think of them as, as looking into prehistory. And Charlie Faulkner has certainly done that. He's done some fascinating work uh, in prehistoric Tennessee looking at mysteries like the old stone fort down near where Bonnaroo is held every year, um, but also has done some, uh, some, uh, some work here in Knoxville with historic architecture, archaeology, which is studying, uh, studying the remains of eras we know something about from written records. Uh, but the problem with our the problem with the early pioneers and early founders is that they didn't write a whole lot about their lifestyles. They didn't write, I would love to find someday one account of what it's like to walk down uh, Gay Street in, in 1800 uh, or, or to talk about a typical family meal from that era. We just don't have these uh, this information uh, to speak of from that time. I wish Jane Austen had stepped into early Knoxville and described it as well as she described things in England. But we don't have people like that. So we have Charlie and Terry Faulkner digging up the remains of what these people left and finding out what you know what they uh, what they what clues they can glean from them. I've known them both uh, quite a long time. Uh, Charlie uh, and, and uh, uh, interviewed him probably thirty odd years ago as a journalist uh, when he was doing some. Uh, he did he's done lots of lots of projects right in and around Knoxville, early cabin sites uh, like including James White's second home uh, in uh, off Riverside Drive. Um, but also one, I think uh, one of the first times I interviewed him, he was just in, he was digging up a, a place on Kingston Pike where they're about to build the new Unitarian Church, and finding there was a cabin site there, and and uh, finding that people, even though they lived in a crude log cabin, were eating off fine china, uh, imported china in that cabin, uh, which is was interesting to find out. 
Um, but uh, but they've worked at Blunt Mansion. We'll talk about a little bit about that later, and and that's that's in the film as well. But Ramsey House, lots of places around town, as well as some industrial sites from the Victorian era. But also Terry Faulkner, I got to know well about 20 years ago this summer, I think it was when I was working on a story for Metropulse for um, the, uh, the the about the idea of Bearden Village, which was one of her her babies for a long time. Something she really uh, loved. Something that. I think is is a little is, has never been realized, but is a little bit closer to realization today than it was uh, 20 years ago. But without further anything further from me, I'm going to uh, to uh, let us let, let you all see this film that has only been shown in public once, and that was earlier today for our annual fundraiser. But this is our film uh, by Linda Billman and Doug Mills uh, uh, about uh, Charlie and Terry Faulkner. Uh, let it roll, Paul. Jack Neely uh, with the Knoxville History Project here with uh, Charlie and Terry Faulkner and I appreciate you, you joining us today on, on your lovely back porch. Uh, Charlie of course is a you know, very long time archaeologist associated with the UT, uh, probably the best known local archaeologist uh, around today in, in Knoxville and Terry has often worked with Charlie on his archaeological projects uh, but has her own things that she's been working on as well including uh, granite markers around Bearden and, and some other things. Charlie, tell me about UT's archaeological program at the time that you got Oh, here. yes, uh, it was not a teaching program. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the large collection that they made when the WPA uh, excavated sites and, and saved si uh, things that, that were, you know, were going to be destroyed by the, by the dam. When I had a chance to come down here, I was really excited because I yeah. knew about the, uh, about the collections here. You're talking about how you got involved in historical archaeology, yes. which it, 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 a lot of people may not realize that's a distinct, a distinctive aspect of archaeology. <laughs> yes, studying uh, eras that we know some about at least from mm -hmm. written records, but maybe not everything about. There was a lot of construction going on in Knoxville, and uh, one of the uh, things that was going on is a net, is, is a malfunction junction. Uh -huh. And uh, when they started digging there, they ran into a pottery factory. Yeah. This was called the Weaver and Brother. Weaver had a significant, uh, you know, small but significant pottery factory, sounds like. It's something even industrial type stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very, very definitely. For example, they made sewer pipes. That was yeah. one of the things. And as less and less of the uh, stoneware potteries, uh, you know, pots and things yeah. like this were, were wanted, uh, they started uh, so focusing on that. Certainly, I think the major point that brought me into this was the uh, James White site. This, yeah. of course, was our founder of Knoxville and yeah. so forth, yeah. and he had a, a, a farm out yeah. uh, on Drive. Riverside yeah. Drive. Yeah. This, this is where I really began to get interested in, in, in historical archaeology. A lot of people know that James White had a fort in the downtown area. Yes. Uh, not where it is now, but over on what's now State Street. We found, you know, we found a thimble, a silver thimble, which, which had letters and stuff on it. We found all kinds of clothing. We found a lot of fire uh, arms, artifacts. There is a publication out on that excavation. I always tried to at least publish, publish something on the work I did so that they could kind of see what was here in Knoxville yeah. and so forth. Being local, you know, it's kind of like work, work, walking out your back door and then right there it is. Yeah. We also found a lot of this very nice pottery that was being yeah. made at that time. And this was all English pottery. Yeah. This led to a huge collection of artifacts, early artifacts. Charlie collects teapots, <laughs> so but I buy I them for him. Oh, well, are they all broken? Or they... Oh no, no, these are, oh no, no they're, you they're know. teapots. Yeah, you know, but 10, 20, 30 years ago, you know, you could walk into an uh, antique mall and, and you know, here's a 19th, 18th century teapot, you know, and it's $10. <laughs> he would be in one aisle, I'd be in the other, and he would say, honey, I found something good. <laughs> and so that would be like a, a 1780 piece little creamer for a dollar. He would take whole pieces 
for the students to see what those look like rather than just the tiny shirts. And, and Terry, you're, you're attuned to what things look like because you've actually helped him a lot with illustrations, especially in, oh, in, in yes. reports and, and that sort of thing. So yes. you're, you're, a, you're, you're, a, uh, you're a professional uh, Illustrator, designer, artist, uh, is that uh -huh. fair to say? I, I did scientific illustration, graphics, cover designs, etc. Uh, Dr. Charles Faulkner was one of the top um, uh, professors at the University of Tennessee when it came to archaeology. And over the course of the, the time that he was at the university, over several summers, they used the gardens here at Blunt Mansion for their field schools. So they're teaching young archaeologists the, you know, how and why of uh, of how to do a dig. In their digs, um, they found a wide variety of things. Anything that you can think of that is a domestic animal um, out of the river or out of the forest, somebody on the site was eating. And lots of different kinds of pottery and porcelain, uh, some metal items, uh, beads, I believe. One of the most important parts about the work that they did here was to give us a glimpse into the lives of the enslaved. Here. It was always um, a, a hole in our interpretation up until about the 90s um, as to, you know, who were the enslaved peoples that were here, what was their life like. So we, you know, we're able to talk about everything from food ways to the life of the enslaved to, um, you know, kind of day-to-day -day life for the Blunt family based on that work. It's invaluable. The Faulkners worked together on the historic Ramsey House site in East Knox County. Built of Tennessee marble, it survived the ages. There are none of the original uh, outbuildings, you yeah. know, like smokehouse and all yeah. that sort of thing that, that was yeah. preserved yeah. here in the 20th century. Yeah. But we were excavating to find the remains of those. Yeah. His nickname is Postal Man because he's excellent at identifying postal. So what oh. they found out there were upright beams or mm -hmm. posts, or, and then they had horizontal slats on yeah. it that protected the compound from well wild animals and at that time Indians. In 1793, Tennessee's frontier was dotted with fortifications as white settlers pushed their way into Indian territory. Knoxville was the intended target of at least a thousand vengeful Chickamauga, Cherokee, and Creek warriors. Instead, they turned their rage toward a fortified settlement in modern-day West Knoxville called Cabot Station and the 13 people in it. The Cavett station was particularly uh, ominous in, in, in that uh, uh, the, 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 the people who were in there uh, surrendered mm -hmm. uh, to the Indians. The Indians said, well, we won't harm you, you know, and we'll trade you for white captives. And then when they unlocked the doors and came out, they killed them, mm -hmm. killed all the Cavets. Supposedly bury them, we don't know. And so when I got interested in Cabot Station, one of the things I wanted to find out, well, one of the two things I wanted to find out, one was exactly where the cabin was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the second was, where are the bodies? It's quite interesting, but I spent two seasons out there, and um, we still do not know exactly where the cabin was. Mm -hmm. The 19th century Mars Hill Cemetery may have started as the burial place of one of the Cabots who died before the massacre. Dr. Faulkner wrote a book about the massacre in 2013. A lot of the interest in 2015 uh, around the Cabot Station site um, came about because of a developer wanting to put 30 or 32 houses right here on 12 acres that joined the cemetery. The University of Tennessee team uh, came back and looked in 2016 all around the cemetery here. We did remote sensing out there and found what appear to be a number of graves. And we, we suspect there are more graves here. But anyway, that helped in stopping the development of, of those houses. Dr. Faulkner's research has made all the difference in this area, so he led the way uh, for us to save this land. You've been working with Charlie on various projects of his over the years, uh, but you've also had your own passions, haven't you, about the, the neighborhood where you live? And uh... Uh, I got interested, I think I was maybe president of the Forest Heights Homeowners Association, but I got interested in seeing that the Greenway would continue through Bearden. So during the early 2000s, uh, we got 
state grants and of course the city supported it and then we got it built in sections and as it was being built um, we got grants from the Green Lake Coalition and from um, forget the other city council discretionary funds to fund historic markers, granite historic markers. Yeah. Where did this idea come from though? A lot of a lot of greenways get built with no historic markers at all and they work just fine. But uh, it but came you, right you, out of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but, I just thought, you know, people could learn something while they're at the bus stop. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so uh, uh, we try to get one in every transit stop. <laughs> but you've got uh, just a wide range of things from the old uh, uh, airfield to the uh, mm -hmm. Iron yes. Lots of, uh, of Moonshining, yeah. uh, uh, school history, church history, yeah. Yeah. and I, I put some earth history in. But you were also involved in, uh, in honoring a, a, a certain young rock and roll duo who were uh, yes. who in the neighborhood. Uh, we, uh, all through this period when I was president of the Bureau Council, we were trying to create a sustainable village. The northeast corner of Forest Park Boulevard in Kingston Pike had seen a number of businesses, including this pocket amusement park in the late 1950s. When a gas station on this site was being torn down, a plan was hatched. One of our uh, Bureau Council members had the idea to honor the Everleys because they lived close to that. Yeah. Yeah. So we began fundraising uh, to get the park built, and a lot of people participated in that. The city participated a lot. And it's a small park, but it's an amazing park to look at. It was a great yes. idea to put quotes from, yes. what, uh, seven or eight really famous uh, mm -hmm. singers and songwriters. Mm -hmm. Wayne and I heard that Graham Nash was going to be in town, and so we said, well, let's go to his... Let's go down and you see if you can wrangle a meeting with him after the concert. So he met with us yeah. and he agreed to be honorary park chairperson well, and and to get his, all of his buddies to do yes. quote markers. Grand yes. Master from England, for, originally yes. from the Hollies. You know, the, That's right. So, and yes. he ends up being the guy that yeah. got it connecting Knoxville to uh, all the Everly Brothers uh, influences. That's right. Well, well, let's talk about your your uh, your recent book, the Fort Sanders Project, which is uh, several years in the making, kind of rethinking in a way about uh, exactly where Fort Sanders was. The most famous fort that was ever in Knoxville was the Union Fort that uh, very successfully defended uh, a, a massive Confederate charge in right. November mm -hmm. of 1863, uh, and was still there as a kind of a, a landmark and a, and a tourist site, more or less, in Knoxville for mm -hmm. some years after the war. Uh, but vanished bit by bit as Fort Sanders was developed at somewhere near the top of, 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 uh, of 17th, between 18th and 16th Street. That mm -hmm. it was, that's where Fort Sanders was, at the top of the hill there. What we did, uh, we followed the, the, the fort as it slowly disappeared through development, right up to present times and the, and the present threats to preserving that great historic, which, what was Knoxville's first western suburb. Uh, so right up to UT and, and uh, you know, apart, apartments continue to be built, houses continue to be torn down. It's not intended just for scholars. Uh, it's, right. you, you can read about the whole story of uh, Civil War in, in uh, the Knoxville area, but also it talks about the, about the, uh, kind of the, the, this new idea that you have about where the fort actually was, which was a couple hundred feet to the west of where people it's assumed that it was. Essentially a block. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, a fascinating subject and, 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 and interesting book with lots of lots of pictures I've never seen. And I want to talk to Charlie about uh, some earlier things in his career, uh, including uh, a, a place uh, that I think of as Tennessee Stonehenge. Uh, the uh, in, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's it's known as the Old Stone Fort, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, actually it's not in Knoxville, but it's very close to a place that Knox, a lot of Knoxvilleans know very well which is the Bonnaroo site, uh, the, the rock and roll festival site uh, down in uh, kind of a, a south central Tennessee, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Cumberland, Cumberland Plateau. Yes, it was. It was just when the state bought the property and was then turning it into a, a park. Yeah. And so they wanted some historic research done. They built uh, two uh, rock walls, one, of, one on the inside and then they filled uh, earth in, in, in inside that and then one on on the outside so you've got this double humped kind of thing but this is all one now it's kind of melded into yeah. in, into one thing yeah. 
This Native American site, known as the Old Stone Fort, dates from 420 B.C. to 20 B.C., according to Dr. Faulkner. The structure's walls come close together at a point facing east, suggesting its purpose. They're solstice markers, or they now think that some of them were uh, related to uh, moonrise. But whatever it was, they put a heck of a lot of work in yeah, on this. Yeah, you know. yeah. But then, you're, you know, we're talking 400 years. In the early 2000s, Dr. Faulkner raised concerns when UT wanted to build a bridge from the agriculture campus to the main campus, and in the way was an ancient structure. Yes, uh, there, there, there's a, a mound there. It's a, a you know, it's a, a, it was a rounded top mound and probably uh, a, a burial mound. Finally, they did, I think they had came up with a pretty good solution. The bridge comes across near the mound and actually you can see it better now than mm -hmm. you used to be able to. Yeah. But doesn't really touch yeah. the mound. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, and a you know, fascinating place. I, I'm surprised more people don't know about it. I've looked, uh, there are only three or four campuses in America that have a mound on campus. And, mm -hmm. and this really? is a, in fact, one has a fake mound that oh. they discovered <laughs> that, uh, that they've been bragging about for years. And that we actually have a genuine uh, Yes, it's genuine. I don't think yeah, there's any question right. about that. Yeah. Charlie, I, I'm sure you've worked with a lot of students over the years, uh, and uh, and and I, I, do you, or, have you watched their careers as they've gone from there? Have some of them stayed in, arch in, in archaeology? Oh yes, yes, uh, quite a few yeah. uh, students. It's been enjoyable. I mean, that's one of the things that really makes, you know, my work what it is because of the students. I had the pleasure and honor of working with Charlie Faulkner, as we all call him, um, uh, or Big Charlie, as <laughs> often my students would call him. Um, you know, in the early uh, 90s, contacted him about coming to school here for my PhD. And I was really interested in, in his research he was doing and his students that they were doing at that time, which was expanding and working at uh, African American history and through archaeology. Knoxville's history, like many towns' histories, you know, focus mostly focus on white male rich history, you know, the popular um, history of, of, you know, dates and names and whatever, which is good and celebrate those things, but it's the everyday people whose lives that we know the least about. And I think that's really his biggest contribution is breaking that barrier, telling a more complete, more dem democratic story about the people of Knoxville. Terry Faulkner and, and Charlie are our team. It was her interest in local history and uh, her knowledge um, that really inspired Charlie to try to do more in Knoxville. Her being an artist, you know, you know, as a scientist, you can, you can twist and turn all the data tables and graphs and whatever you want, and count and weigh everything. But it was through her visualization of the artwork that allowed us to sort of see, all right, what did that look like? We're both fascinated with, you know, what's coming out of the earth and what story it tells and trying to figure it out. He's the man. He's had a stellar career and he's made contributions galore in so many different areas. It's just uh, very proud of him. Thank you, honey. You're welcome. I'm proud of her too. I never would have <laughs> been able to do it if she wasn't, you know, well, uh, completely in, involved in this. Well, I, I appreciate your time, both of you, oh. uh, Charlie and Terry Faulkner, and, and, and you're welcome. And, and for being part of the Nostal History Project. For, for, uh, 2021 and, and, and congratulations on, on the uh, designation. This was, uh, thank you. Different. It's it's an honor. We're mm -hmm. thrilled. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
I'm, I'm on, I guess. Good. Um, uh, uh, what'd y'all think? Is, uh, that was a pretty, pretty impressive with that, uh, with that 18 minute uh, film. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. I think we need to add some kind of jazzy music to the end of it, but, um, but it's, uh, it is pretty good overview of, uh, of their, their lives and their lives together, working together on various projects. Uh, we want to just kind of open it up now to a discussion in sort of a free form style. We're going to show some images that we have, and I'll share some, you know, memories of, of various uh, uh, things I've witnessed uh, having to do with these images. Um, and I guess we'll just start with uh, with the first one, Paul. Uh, we just have a, a picture of uh, of, uh, of Blunt Mansion, which is a, a house that I'm sure is is familiar to all of and to all of you. Uh, but this is uh, I. I can't uh, emphasize enough what a rarity it is to have a house like this, uh, ostensibly the first frame house built uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and, uh, and it's the only house, literally the only house uh, in, a, in a town that, that had two to, two to 300 houses in it in the 1790s when it was the founding place of the state of Tennessee in 1796. This is literally the only house still standing from that time. And we know something about William Blunt uh, uh, and his, his career, both as a, as a politician and a landowner and, and various other aspects, but we don't know a lot about how they lived here at Blunt Mansion. And we don't know a lot about uh, the people who were his servants, his, uh, the people who were enslaved who worked at uh, Blunt Mansion. Uh, and uh, we don't know for sure where they lived. The Faulkners have done a lot of work uh, digging around here and found a great many clues as they, they mentioned uh, in, in terms of uh, what they ate, for example, their you know, evidence they ate uh, mussels and other shellfish from the river uh, as well as, as other things there. But that was, uh, this is still a work in progress. We have clues, but not a full story for uh, how people lived at Blunt Mansion in the 1790s and later on. Of course, the same house was later on the, the home of many other families, uh, everybody from Jim Thompson to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Samuel Beckett Boyd, who was mayor of Knoxville in the 1840s, uh, lived here. So it's, uh, it's got a, a whole lot of history beyond the Blunts, but, uh, but there are still probably things to discover under that, uh, under that uh, green, green turf. Uh, next slide, please. And here's uh, here's uh, the the book that Charlie wrote a few years ago, uh, Massacre at Cabot Station, about his studies at Cabot Station, which, if you're not familiar with it, is on the kind of on the western fringe of West Hills, not too far from Kingston Pike. This is the uh, site of the uh, uh, what what is a, a later era graveyard, which is believed to be to have begun as a Cabot family graveyard back in the 1790s, probably even before the massacre. Uh, we don't know for sure where these 13 people were buried. It's assumed that they might have been buried in a, in a mass grave on this site, but this is very close to neighborhoods. In fact, there are, uh, there are places named for Alexander Cabot and, uh, and uh, believe it or not, Doublehead, one of the, I think, the most uh, 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 violent of the of the Chickamaugan chiefs. They were, these were not uh, rank-and-file Cherokee. The, the Chickamaugans were kind of the radicals who did not uh, have any uh, have any uh, tolerance for the idea of white people living on this side of the uh, the, mat the mountains, and uh, were ready to destroy the uh, the, the the capital, the south cap capital of the southwestern territory, which was the city of Knoxville, and they could easily have done so that day, uh, but uh, thanks to a rather complex ruse uh, by only thirty eight uh, men who were left in town, uh, they were discouraged and and uh, withdrew after, after destroying Cabot Station and the people in it. Uh, but this is still a bit of a mystery. Uh, we know a good deal more about it, uh, thanks to what Charlie uh, has uncovered in his archaeological research there. Uh, but there's still a great deal more to uh, still to, to learn at, about that, I believe. Uh, next one, please. Yeah. yeah, 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 go ahead, Paul. You saw this. Oh, this is a photograph that I we've been invited to various things at uh, Cabot, well, a couple of times at Cabot Station. They have various events with the, the DAR. This was from 2017. This was a kind of a musket volley salute. Um, but the last time they did one, a couple of years ago, they actually, uh, Charlie Faulkner was the, was the main speaker. 
Yeah, and and there were not not just reenactors, uh, but there are actually uh, Native Americans attending uh, the the last uh, event there, and that was a it was a very interesting assembly of uh, of people just contemplating what happened there and contemplating what what we know about it and what we don't don't know about it yet. This was Jack, also like, by the way. I'm sorry. I'd like to add that the the site is not necessarily easily visible it, it's it's fairly easy to see it's, it's not really a formal parking area there yet but there are hopes and perhaps plans that um there will be some kind of uh, an entrance way uh, you could probably park in the small parking lot of the apartment building which is slightly further down the road um but it but it is neat to see the site and also where uh, the mars the mars hill cemetery as well or if you know someone in the Capital Station neighborhood, uh, they might let you through yeah. the back garden. But uh, yeah. if anyone seriously uh, wants to do some research, uh, contact us. We could connect you with the right people. Yeah, you have to actually walk through backyards to uh, to get to the to the uh, graveyard. But uh, next one, please. Yeah, yeah. Here's uh, here's the cover of the uh, newest uh, their newest book, Rediscovering Fort Sanders. And it compiles a lot of their research. I say a lot and not all their research because they've actually found some more uh, things since this book came out. Uh, but this uh, book was published just last year. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, an overview of the Civil War in Knoxville, but specifically about, uh, about, especially about Fort Sanders. I think there's more about the fort itself in this book than any other, any other book I've, I've, I've seen. Uh, but they uh, they talk about how it was built, who was in charge of it, and and, uh, and talk about various aspects of of the defensive nature of this fort. This was the largest fort of all the Union forts in Knoxville. Uh, there were almost twenty of them around the city of Knoxville. This was the largest, and the, this was the the site of the uh, attack by uh, by uh, uh, men uh, several uh, hundred men under. General uh, Longstreet on uh, a, a very icy morning in November of 1863, uh, they attacked from the uh, northwest uh, on this uh, on Fort Sanders, and and it was a it was a horrific uh, debacle. It was a disaster for the Confederates, uh, such a disaster that Longstreet offered to resign his command uh, after afterward. Uh, but it was uh, uh, in just 20 minutes, they knew it was over. A uh, uh, hundred and uh, some odd Confederates were killed. Uh, many of them in this ditch. Uh, they were, they tried, they, they didn't, many of them didn't know that ditch was there and fell into it as they were attacking the fort. And the uh, icy walls of the, the fort made it almost impossible to climb up. Uh, a few of them, I think, made it over to the, over the top, but uh, not for long. Uh, there were, uh, uh, and I think uh, what only eight Union soldiers were killed uh, that, in that attack. Um, they're buried at uh, at, at uh, National Cemetery. We have a book about that that you can read online. But anyway, this was uh, just a, a, a massive uh, failure of uh, the Confederate attack and ended the Confederate siege of Knoxville, but it lasted for several weeks before that. This, these pictures are all taken after the battle, and it's it's it looks like a like a lunar landscape almost. So it's disorienting to see these pictures for anybody that's familiar with Fort Sanders at all. That knows of it as a very lush, uh, tree shaded neighborhood uh, with lots of Victorian houses in it. Uh, this is before all that, and and you can you can tell that this was a forested area before the war, but they cut down all the trees so so that no one could sneak up on them. They also used the stumps. Uh, to string with telegraph wire, to trip wire, to to uh, to to, uh, to uh, discourage uh, attacks. Here's one of the few pictures that you can see something recognizable, and that is the uh, the college in the background. That is the uh, what was then called East Tennessee College, up on the hill. That is what became UT. Now none of those buildings up there are still there today. But those were the cluster of buildings that constituted the the, uh, the college that became UT after the Civil War. It's interesting that when uh, President Humes was president and he had been a foreign, he'd been a Unionist during the Civil War, he be, he became uh, he was president after uh, for several years after the war. But he immediately wanted to uh, wanted to remove the scars of war, and he he got uh, he got the the students to, to to labor themselves to fill in the trenches. They were on the hill. Uh, that were uh, that were part of the fortifications there on the hill. 
Um, but that was uh, very not, not very far away from Fort Sanders uh, at all, as you can see here. This fort was here for quite a long time after the war. Uh, it was visible. In fact, it's visible even described even in James Agee's novel, A Death in the Family, set in 1915, 1916, that there are, are still uh, remnants of the fort, ruins of the fort that are overgrown, this overgrown patch of ruins in the neighborhood. And Agee uh, didn't describe exactly where it was, just that it was, it was near their house. Um, but this was uh, there was an attempt in the 1890s, by the way, to make this a, a proper national military park. Uh, William Rule was uh, was in charge of was was a leader of that promoter of that idea. It just didn't uh, didn't work out. Yielded to development pressure, and this is uh, from you know circa 1920. This is by this time a lot of a lot of houses have been built up in Fort Sanders, and this is uh, what you see in the middle is Fort Sanders Hospital, the original uh, beautiful Fort Sanders Hospital. It was as it was built, uh, completed in 1920. Uh, was designed by the same architect, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, Fred Manley, who designed uh, the Medical Arts Building downtown. Uh, but that's a uh, you know that's a lovely kind of a, almost Tudorish style uh, hospital as it was then. Uh, but this is a uh, alongside 19th Street that you see in the middle there, uh, and that's uh, and that's just to the west of where the Faulkners think the ramparts of Fort Sanders were. They they think that at this time there were st still some some visible ruins up along 18th Street uh, there and, and make their case in, in, in great detail in the, in the book. Um, but this was a, a kind of a depression area that was that actually was a natural and was part of the uh, was had, had to be dealt with in the uh, in the actual Confederate charge. Uh, next one, please. You know, Robin Thompson, by the way, the guy, the aerial photographer was the brother of Jim Thompson, uh, and, and he was our first Aerial photographer, really. I think he learned it in uh, in aerial training during World War One, and came back and became a well-known aerial photographer in the 1920s. Had his own business. All right, this is uh, from 1890. Uh, something kind of extraordinary that they had a reunion of uh, Union and Confederate uh, veterans to come together. People who had been trying to kill each other uh, only uh, 25 years earlier uh, came here together in, uh, in, in Knoxville and met at this, at this battleground that they knew very well uh, and had a big, big party that lasted several days. They had fireworks, uh, the, the ramparts were still there, the ruins were still there, they, they had fireworks every night uh, as part of this thing. And this, was, uh, this is an interesting picture uh, for a detail that I didn't know until Paul mentioned it today. You see, uh, well, there's one house on the right. Uh, the, it's called a Harrison House that was up uh, near uh, Laurel Avenue, um, and probably at near 16th Street. Uh, but that uh, big tent on the left there is, uh, it says uh, P.T. Barnum on it. This was a Barnum and Bailey tent that that Barnum and Bailey decided was too big for them to carry around, so they just ditched it in Knoxville, and we found use for it. Uh, during the blue gray reunion uh it's a it's an enormous enormous tent i'm not sure i've ever seen, seen a tent that big before but that's uh, where they had uh, uh they had some uh some veterans who were who were camping out and some were just attending uh events there in, inside the tent but this uh this is a an interesting kind of fascinating picture a lot of the area to the i think to the east of this picture was being developed, but, uh, but this area obviously had not uh, been much. Uh, and part of this was later known as the Rose Hole, uh, I think. But uh, anyway, this is a, a, a fascinating picture. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, here's a, here's a souvenir uh, with pictures of Grant and Lee, who neither one of whom had anything to do with the Knoxville uh, campaign, although Lee was a commanding officer of, uh, of, of, of Longstreet. Uh, Longstreet was more answering to Bragg at the time that he made the attack on Knoxville. Uh, Grant was in Knoxville a few weeks after the, uh, after the battle um, uh, as part of the, uh, the forces that arrived here along with Sherman to, to be sure that everything was secure here. Um, but uh, anyway, this is, a, a, I guess, a program that they handed out to the, the veterans uh, who attended the reunion. reunion. 
All right, here's a, a fascinating memory that uh, that Paul found uh, the soldiers who visit Knoxville during their reunion will not recognize the Knoxville of today as the Knoxville 27 years ago. Uh, as an old veteran with one leg from Nebraska remarked to a reporter, uh, I came expecting to see the same Knoxville of war times, but I do not. There is a large bustling city which has taken the place of the old Knoxville. I recognize nothing at all, save a few points along the river near the foot of Gay Street. I got off the train at the depot and was lost. When I was here as a soldier, there was not a house on the north side of the East Tennessee Railroad. That is not a house like north of Depot Street. There were probably a few, but uh, there, there, he's right, there were not many. Not Knoxville was really clustered near the river, uh, south of what we know as the, uh, as the southern, uh, old southern station. Um, but that's uh, that. A lot of people remarked that Knoxville was not a very impressive city during the Civil War. It was really just beginning to grow with the industry that was brought by railroads at the time, and really bloomed after the war. Um, but uh, here's a picture looking down uh, down Gay Street. We're looking. That's the old uh, Baptist Church steeple, which stands about where near where the arcade building is today. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to think if any of these buildings are still are. Yeah, there are. There should be some of these buildings that are still there today. Uh, uh, I think the Fidelity Building is visible in the, that picture, and a few others, but not not very many. Uh, a lot of these were burned down in the uh, big fire. All right, here's another uh, the story about that tent that we just saw. Um, the Honorable P.T. Barnum uh, was was too large, too large for the show business. His great bulk rendering it un unhandy to transport from place to place. It was purchased from Mr. Barnum by the Society of the Army of West Virginia and used for annual gatherings for, anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the tent where you just saw a picture of. All right, there, and there it is again, uh, a little bit closer. Um, but that's the, the ruins of the fort and the, the, the issue about it is exactly where, where those were. You see the ruins in some old pictures, some old maps of Knoxville, uh, and 17th Street seems to lead up to them, and they seem to be on both sides in those in those maps, both sides of 17th Street. Next one, please. All right, here's a, we're getting into Bearden now. This is a, a picture that we we took uh, for uh, or we had taken by Sean Pointer. Uh, from uh, Bearden Hill, uh, just a, an amazing picture to see on the right that the church you see there in the sort of foreground is the uh, Sacred Heart Cathedral, amazingly new, I think only three years old now, Sacred Heart Cathedral, but over on the left uh, you see the uh, lakeshore, uh, uh, the, the last building remaining of, of the old mental institution uh, up on top of the hill there, not the very, I guess the last, the last of the original buildings from 1880. Five uh, is is that one there that I'm glad is has been preserved and is still there and is is open to the public. But uh, anyway, that's a uh, just a great, a beautiful picture of Bearden uh, combining these two very interesting pieces of architecture, uh, one old and one new, uh, and and sort of giving a sense of of Bearden as a is a more beautiful place than we may pay attention to when we're driving down Kingston Pike. Yeah. Okay. Here's one of uh, Terry's uh, uh, several great uh, uh, historical markers. Uh, the site of the clay burrow pit of the Alex A. Scott Brick Company, 1904-1922. Uh, the kilns used to fire the clay bricks were located adjacent to the Norfolk Southern Rail Railroad tracks on the present site of Kroger Plaza. Um, so that was uh, this was uh, the area where uh, where uh, uh, Western Plaza is now. Uh, that was the clay burrow pit area. But the uh, Scott uh, Brick Company, that, if you've heard of the Brickyard in respect to Beard and the Brickyard was uh, also the name of the, the African-American community that was over in the Hamburg Place area. And it was named that because so many of the African-Americans who moved there, uh, moved there to work for the Brickyard uh, so they could just commute by a uh, commute on foot um, there. And that remained an African-American com community up to the 1970s. Uh, the area was known as this Hamburg Place. Um, but this is the, the Alex A. A. Scott Brick Company, which was over near where, uh, not far from where Kroger is in, in, uh, in, in Bearden. But they had a, it was a major producer of bricks. All right, and here's the old, uh, here's a, a marker uh, denoting uh, the old uh, airport on, uh, along Southern Avenue. 
talk about George A. Tobler, and you probably know Tobler uh, Road there on uh, which intersects Sutherland uh, and is one of many small farms. And that's where the, the, the airport was. It was it was actually an airstrip by about 1920 or so and was considered finally the, to be the best airstrip in Knoxville, even though it was not ideal. Uh, but for 17 years or so, that was a place where planes took off and landed from the early days. And here's uh, right before it became McGee Tyson Airport. Uh, this was still when it was still called the Southern Airfield or Aviation Field or sometimes Bearden Field. Uh, but this was uh, this was uh, this was the airport down there where where West High School and uh, the National Guard Armory are today. We go into uh, into this story in great detail in our our Historic Bearden book, uh, and, uh, and and have, if you want to know more about that, uh, look at that because we it's a fascinating era this this era era. It was not only they had commercial flying uh, by 1921 they were having. Passengers being taken up just on excursion flights. Uh, you could just wait in line and, and get taken up in an airplane. And it's fascinating. The first day they did that, uh, policemen, judges, uh, uh, musicians, all sorts of people just just lined up to take a to take a flight in an airplane. And the first commercial uh, passenger commercial flights were taken out of, of this spot and in, uh, in uh, right in, along Sutherland Avenue. But uh, but also they had stunt flying and stuff down there, and you know sometimes as many as ten thousand people would crowd down along several and to watch uh, 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 Jimmy Doolittle do and people like that do do stunt flying above the uh, above the airfield. Next one, please. All right, here's a here's a marker for the old the original site of Bearden School, uh, which was not far from where Bearden Plaza is today, just to the west of where Bearden School later settled. Uh, this was the original Bearden School. This is this is the one, um, just to, like I say, just to the west of, uh, of West Now Bearden uh, Elementary School, which we, uh, I think we have a slide of that as well. But, uh, but that was all, yeah, all the kind of the, the epicenter of, of Bearden. Um, and uh, I'm glad that Carrie made these things, and this Dr. Robert Sutherland, for whom Sutherland Avenue was named, uh, and it's uh, talks about Ben Sprankel, who was an early uh, developer of, of that of that area, uh, named Sutherland Avenue for his close friend, Dr. Sutherland, uh, who was not just a, a Northerner, as uh, as she notes here. He was he was a Canadian, huh? Dr. Sutherland was, but he was the minister, uh, the Presbyterian minister at Sacred Presbyterian Church for some years. And much beloved by some people, including uh, the uh, developer uh, Ben Sprankel. And uh, here's a bit about the railroad, uh, the railroad that that runs, uh, which was the very first railroad ever built through East Tennessee, was the East Tennessee uh, and Georgia line, and uh, finished in 1855. Uh, we have stories about how the uh, the first uh, train to arrive in Knoxville included some stowaways from Bearden, some boys who had, who had jumped on the train at, at Bearden uh, just because they wanted to be on the very first train to arrive in, in the city of Knoxville. Um, uh, but this was uh, this was the and it still is the same line today. It's been there for you know, all this time, 160, uh, 66 years. Uh, but uh, it, as she, she says it became part of the Southern system. Uh, this was a, a, a nostril based train line, by the way, the, the East Tennessee and Georgia combined with the East Tennessee and Virginia were a nostril based uh, uh, train system. And they became a, a fairly large uh, train system connecting a lot of the mid South uh, uh, for 25 years or so it was based in Knoxville until it, they sold out to JP Morgan's new system called the Southern Railway in 1894. But we still have that uh, railroad today. All right, here's uh, right alongside that railroad, uh, and this uh, is a uh, what they called a, a, a what they believe to be a redan. The, the Faulkners have been involved in in, uh, in in studying this, and and think it's at least plausible that this is a was a, a fort. You can't really tell. You, it's much more dramatic if you go there in person. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, some obviously un unnatural uh, uh, earthworks there, but uh, this was uh, believed to be a fort with a, uh, a small gun or, or emplacement to protect 
the trestle, and there's still a trestle across Third Creek uh, there, um, there along uh, where, where, where it was in, in the, uh, during the Civil War in 1860s. There was a previously a, a bridge there, a, a different bridge, but it's still an old bridge, a masonry bridge there today. But I think, yes, this is the track. Uh, this is uh, a track that goes all the way to Concord. Uh, so that was uh, Concord uh, sprang up as a, as a railroad community at the same time as this, this railroad track was built along the East Tennessee and Georgia line. Next one. All right, here's the uh, National Guard Armory, which I didn't know very much about until we did the research for the historic Bearden book. Um, and uh, this was, uh, Armory had been uh, in the other places that it, interestingly had been uh, downtown, uh, or near downtown. It was actually on the, uh, it actually was located downtown and was in, in the in Market Square at one time. Uh, but they later, it, they had uh, a, a large armory on the foot of the hill uh, at UT in a an old building called Jefferson Hall, which had been used for certain events uh, before uh, the 1920s and 30s. But uh, they found out a giant wooden building may not be the best place to store a whole lot of ammunition because in, uh, in the 1930s, it went up in flames and it really exploded with multiple, multiple explosions. Many people thought it was planned fireworks and came out just to behold it, not realizing how dangerous it was. Fortunately, nobody was killed, but uh, it was, uh, it, when it blew up like that, they said, we need a better place. And they, they finally settled over here on uh, Sutherland Avenue and built the uh, permanent armory, which is still there today. And this uh, armory played a role in the Second World War uh, and every war, I, I, I think it's safe to say every war since then. Um, but this armory was not just an armory. It was also, it's been used for public purposes. It had, uh, there was a time when they hosted dances there in the 1940s and 50s. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, some fairly big jazz bands played there in the, in the, in the late 30s, early 40s. But also later on, uh, I'm told Otis Redding did a, a concert there in the early 1960s. I've talked to people who were there. Uh, if you remember Otis Redding at the National Guard Armory in the early 60s, let me know. I haven't found uh, a lot about it in print, but I don't doubt that it happened. But this is all again on that same site that, that, was, the, uh, that was the airfield. All right, and here's Everly Brothers Park. And uh, the Everly Brothers are, uh, it's, I, I, I think it's a great credit to the Faulkners and, and other people who've brought this to light because 30 years ago, I would say they're, they're, the number of people who knew that the Everly Brothers ever lived in Knoxville consisted mostly of the people who knew them at West High School in the 50s. This was not widely known, um, but this has become a, kind of a big deal since then. The Everly Brothers did not live in Knoxville for long, but I think it's appropriate to remember them here uh, for several reasons. One is that uh, even though they were here, I think for less than three years, uh, they had uh, been, their, their uh, father was kind of an itinerant uh, musician, traveled around some, they had lived in Kentucky and Chicago, and uh, it's spent a lot of time in Iowa, but they end up in Knoxville in the mid-1950s, and that's, uh, that's uh, the Everly Brothers, uh, uh, I believe it's Phil and Don on the left, and, and Ike, the father, and uh, the mother uh, is playing the bass there, but uh, but they were a family band. They were they did a lot of gospel stuff when they arrived in Knoxville. They were uh, performing on WROL, especially on uh, Kaz Walker's uh, uh, station, and and thought they were going to do pretty well in Knoxville. And it was kind of not a great time. I think that the the era of live radio was beginning to wane a little bit, and there may not have been the same appetite for family gospel bands uh, in the early '50s when they arrived here as there had been before. Um, but uh, it was in Knoxville during this fairly short period of time that the uh, two Everly brothers, Phil and Don, began playing together as a duo. And it's also where uh, here in Knoxville, they began experimenting with uh, a new form of music called rock and roll. Uh, they, they discovered uh, some uh, records at the old uh, 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 Dugout Doug's uh, record store on Cremont Avenue and uh, Bo Diddley records and began trying to sound like Bo Diddley on, 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 on guitar. And in fact, they never completely uh, got rid of that influence, but, uh, they, but they began singing in a sweet gospel style, but with 
with uh, with rock and roll uh, licks uh, that uh, became uh, very uh, uh, an interesting duo. The, the story is that they were they were eventually uh, the Kaz Walker didn't know what to do with them and eventually uh, either fired or fired them or had some uh, significant uh, disagreement that, that got them uh, walking out of his studio on Gay Street. Uh, in 1955, and uh, and another thing that happened in Austin was while they were here, they met a guy named Chet Atkins, who was a major by that time a major producer in Nashville, and he said, "Well, why don't you go to Nashville? We'll see what we can do." And uh, they they went to Nashville, and often with Chet Atkins, uh, uh, not only producing the records but but playing on some of them, uh, they made some of the the you know the great uh, great early rock and roll uh, songs that they that they that they became famous for. And of course, one of their songs is called Kathy's Clown. I think it was their biggest hit of, of all in America. Uh, and it was uh, one of the relatively few songs that they wrote themselves. And it was about a woman that I believe Don had dated at West High School, who, uh, who uh, that, that uh, it was a relationship that ended uh, uh, unsatisf unsatisfactorily for him, at least. And that he wrote uh, a story about how he, he didn't like the, the other kids making fun of him about uh, losing his girlfriend. But uh, anyway, they were a, a great duo and they had such a, an enormous influence on so many people, more than I realized. I had no idea that that uh, people like Albert King or Bob Dylan or, or, uh, were influenced by them. I knew that they influenced Simon and Garfunkel and the Beach Boys and the Beatles. But they, uh, thanks to Dwayne Grieve and uh, Graham Nash, who's also a big fan, uh, they, got, uh, they got quotations just written for this Knoxville Park. Uh, from people like Bob Dylan, from uh, from Paul Simon, from Paul McCartney, uh, who uh, describes how he and John, when they first began performing, they would they would pretend they were the Early Brothers and try to sound like them. Um, and uh, over the years, that the Beatles themselves were were compared to them so much that they called themselves the Four Everly Brothers. Um, but uh, but also the Beach Boys, uh, Brian Wilson um, uh, he has a quote there. Uh, so it's a, it's just a it's a major probably the best possible uh, tribute you can have to a, a musical influence is getting uh, musicians to to remember these influences and and actually in, engraving them and permanently in a park as uh, as they have done uh, between the Dwayne Grieve and the Faulkners and the other people who were on that committee that that made that work. Um, Along with the Everly Brothers' mother, who's uh, who's still alive, I think she's close to 100 years old, uh, but she's been uh, involved in this project as well. But uh, all right, is that it? All right, we have uh, uh, a couple of books uh, we, that we're we're selling here. The Faulkner's uh, Rediscovering Fort Sanders is on the left, and our own book uh, Historic Bearden uh, is on the right. Uh, so we're uh, we're we're happy to. To uh, to get you a copy of those if you, if you want one and um, and as well as our our own uh, uh, historic Knoxville the Curious Visitors Guide so uh, all of our books are are here and and, uh, and you're welcome to come by and have a look at them if you want to. All right, well, thanks for uh, to Paul and Nicole for this uh, remarkable achievement to to show a to show a film and have it have it work pretty well I thought uh, but but we're we're grateful to that to be able to show that film that. And y'all are among the first people to have ever seen it. I think at this point, maybe uh, about a hundred people have seen it. And it's, uh, but it's now. I think it's, I'm, I'm told it's uh, permanently available on YouTube now. So uh, if if you know someone else that wants to see it, you, you can probably find it. Most